Hello and a warm welcome to everyone. As you know, this past year has been quite horrible because of the ravages of the coronavirus. Almost everyone has lost someone near and dear, a relative, a friend, a teacher or student. At the Asian College of Journalism, three of our alumni to this deadly virus, and it has been quite heartbreaking for all of us. However, during the last year, we can also derive quiet satisfaction from the fact that the online classes have gone very well and that almost all of our students of the ACJ class of 2021 will be graduating today. And to honor the occasion of our convocation on this day, we have a very distinguished speaker, Professor Pratap Banu Mehta, political philosopher and public intellectual to deliver the Lawrence Dana Pinkham Memorial Lecture on a very apt subject for the times, who is interested in truth? Reflections on our times. But before that, we have the presentation of two prestigious awards, the ACJ Investigative Journalism Award and the KP Narayana Kumar Award for Social Impact Journalism. Again, KP Narayana Kumar was an alumnus from the very first academic year. Un unfortunately, he passed away a few years ago, and this award is instituted in his memory. Before I end this very brief uh, welcome address, let me wish all our graduating students the very best for the future. Above all, be safe and keep safe. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Nalini. Uh, well, as Nalini said, to say that it has been a, a challenging year, uh, in many ways a difficult year at the ACJ, would be stating the obvious. Our students, their families, our faculty and our staff, our well-wishers joining us today. Indeed, all of us gathered online today to mark this event have been at the receiving end of the pandemic that has invaded our lives in one way or the other. Some of us getting away lightly, others not so lucky. How devastating the times can be was brought home to us cruelly, as Nandini just mentioned, these last couple of months when we lost three of our alumni, Ashish Yachuri, the class of 2011, and Shaoli Rudra, the class of 2008, were snatched from our midst in April to, on the 22nd of April. Sumit Josh, the class of 2015, on May 18th. We remember them as we mark the close of another year at the ACJ. But it's a matter of some defined pride, if you like, for us that we have not let the pandemic disrupt our year. The class of 2021, which is what this convocation is about, has in a sense been a trendsetter. We have not allowed the adverse circumstances to dilute the program or the curriculum in any way. Indeed, we have innovatively harnessed technology and skill sets to deliver the course online, using, for example, a team viewer and the Wirecast system to enable students and faculty access and work with equipment studios, production studios, post-production suites, work on the Bloomberg terminals for the students in the business and financial journalism program and so on. The online mo module or the online mode also brought or enabled us to leverage some of the best expertise in different disciplines from universities across the world to deliver a number of modules for our students. All this of course does not, uh, did not, compensate for the experience, the, the camaraderie, the learning that a vibrant physical campus life brings. And yet about 40 students did come and stay on the campus towards the last term or towards the close last term of last of the year, I think. But it wasn't the same with the COVID protocol and the kind of silo behavior and cramped lifestyle that it demanded. We have realized too, the unique advantages and benefits of online learning and teaching aspects and teaching. 
aspects of which will outlive, I think, the pandemic and forced resort to online and become part of a new normal, although it's a cliche term, in the years ahead. I think I can confidently say that through all this, ACJ continues to not only stay abreast, but a step ahead of the best and uh, the cutting edge in practices in a new age of journalism, fraught as it is with threats and challenges, but also bristling with new possibilities and opportunities. Let me congratulate the young diplomates of this convocation. Let me wish all of you uh, better times ahead and well-being. Thank you for being with us today. I now request our trusty uh, Enram to say a few words. Ram, you're muted, I think. Can you? Unmute, yeah. Okay. yeah. I just wish to make a couple of points very briefly to the, to the outgoing class. You have completed a course of purposeful postgraduate study and practice at what we believe is one of the best journalism schools in the world. Now you'll be entering careers in a field that offers opportunities as well as challenges. I'm not referring to the media in general. I'm speaking here primarily about journalism. The state of the media and the state of journalism might be closely interrelated, but they are at their heart two different things. Everyone knows that the economics, ecosystem, and ways of the media have been disrupted in the most profound sense in the digital age. And the relationship between technology and journalism has been evolving very rapidly in recent years. But does this imply that the elements of journalism, its conceptual frame and its values have been rendered obsolete by these technology-led transformations? I certainly don't believe so. And I don't, and the ACJ certainly doesn't believe so. The intrinsic relevance and value of journalism as a democratic craft remains. It is a method, however imperfect, of capturing the world of events and ideas as they occur. Journalism in the serious sense is a professional pursuit. Its core tasks, which are relevant today more than ever, are one, verification, two, sense-making, three, bearing witness, and for investigation. You have learned and practiced this, even if it's online, at the ACJ over the past year. You have also learned that journalism, while being a professional pursuit, is not value neutral. It is premised on such principles as truth-telling, truth freedom and independence, fairness and justice, humaneness, and working in the public interest that is for the social good. But if you look at the current state of journalism in India, you also do to do a reality check. I don't have the time to elaborate on this point, except to state that the functions and values of journalism as they are taught in a first rate J school have come under pressure. And quite often they have come under threat and assault as well. Some of this has to do with the economics of contemporary journalism, but even more significant is a challenge our democratic craft faces from authoritarian rulers. Since we have a very distinguished chief guest and convocation lecturer, a political scientist and political philosopher and public intellectual who has been in the thick of the action revolving around freedom of expression and our democratic liberties, I will not say more about this challenge. What I wish to say to you, the outgoing class in Conclusion is, stand up for your profession, the elements of journalism as a democratic craft, update your knowledge and develop and sharpen your professional capabilities and skills, stand up for journalism's basic purpose and values, protect its independence as best as you can. And to the award winners, I don't know who they are yet, I'm waiting as eagerly as anyone else, congratulations in advance. Thank you. Thank you, Ram. We now move to the first part of the event, which is the announcement and presentation of the ACJ Journalism Awards. There are two awards. 
And to take you through this segment, I invite the convener of the ACJ Journalism Awards, uh, Nikhil Kanikal, to, uh, to join us now. Nikhil, over to you. You're muted, Nick. Hi, are you able to hear me now? Yeah. And is my screen visible? Yes. Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you again. Uh, so, uh, thank you for the warm introduction, uh, Ms. Manali Rajan, Mr. Shashkumar, and Mr. Ram. Uh, and a warm welcome to everyone this evening to the ACJ Journalism Awards ceremony. Um, so in the short history that the awards have had, uh, we've been very uh, fortunate to have been uh, graced by some of the most uh, illustrious work in Indian journalism. And uh, as the past winners uh, showcased here illustrate, uh, we've had some of the country's top uh, media houses vying for these awards. Uh, so it's become a hallmark and a wonderful uh, point in professional work for people to uh, aspire to the ACJ awards. Um, we've also been very lucky to have had uh, five distinguished juries who have uh, been a part of our efforts in, in the years uh, 2015 to 2019. Uh, we've had uh, former judges, uh, former editors, uh, members of the ACJ faculty, uh, alumni of the school, uh, and also an award winner come and be a part of the jury. So it's been a wonderful mixture of people who've contributed towards recognizing professional excellence in journalism in India. And we are very grateful to each and every one of you for having been a part of this journey. Now, before we proceed, uh, here's a bit about the awards themselves. Uh, we have two categories uh, this year which is the investigative journalism category and the social impact journalism category. Uh, and the judging criteria is before you. Both the awards comprise a trophy, a citation by the jury. And for the investigative journalism award, we have two lakhs in prize money. And for the social impact journalism award, we have one lakh in prize money. This year we received 45 entries for the investigative journalism and 79 entries for the social impact. We saw over 37 uh, news organizations participate, uh, as well as a large number of freelance or independent journalists who were uh, in, the, in the running. And we received entries in over six languages. So that's a bit about um, how the awards have gone so far. As a part of the process, uh, we have a preliminary jury comprising uh, full-time members of the ACJ uh, faculty uh, to each of whom we are very grateful. Uh, the names are before you here. I'll, I'll quickly read them out. So we had uh, in investigative journalism, uh, Ms. Nani Rajan, Kalyan Arun, K.S. Meenakshi Sundaram, V.K. Raghunathan, and Dhanya Skariachan. And for social impact, we saw uh, Mohan Ram Murthy, Devdas Rajaram, Bridget Lina, Jarsha N.K., Rahul Chandran, Vikas Patak, Preeti Zakaria, and Shalini, Sh Shalini Shah, uh, who comprised the preliminary jury. Um, now, coming to the final jury, uh, we were very uh, lucky this year to uh, be graced by uh, Andrew, Mr. Andrew Whitehead, Ms. Anuradha Raghunathan, and Pari Ravindranathan. I'll introduce each of them very briefly. Uh, Mr. Andrew Whitehead um, has been a former correspondent, presenter, and editor of the BBC World News Service, where he spent uh, 35 years of his career. Uh, he's also a historian and a lecturer, and most recently, the author of a book, uh, a biography of Freda, Freda Bedi. Um, Mr. Whitehead, uh, we're very grateful to have you with us. Um, Ms. Anuradha Raghunathan has uh, been a journalist for over 25 years, having uh, been a reporter with the Dallas Morning News, as well as having been uh, a journalist with uh, Forbes Asia for the last 16 years. Uh, she is also a graduate of the Columbia Journalism School, as well as the University of Madras. Uh, Pari Ravindranathan uh, has, is um, first and foremost an alumni of uh, the Asian College of Journalism. Uh, he is formerly the uh, president and managing director of Bloomberg uh, International. 
um, and is also a global executive and angel investor. So we were very uh, honored to have this illustrious jury amongst us. And uh, I now request uh, Mr. Andrew Whitehead uh, to take over the proceedings and share his remarks as well as the results of the jury's deliberations with us. So Andrew, over to you. Thank you very much indeed, Nikhil. Greetings from London. It's wonderful to be part of this event. And it's been a real honor to chair this year's awards duty, uh, jury and uh, a pleasure to work with my fellow jurors, Anu Raghunathan and Pari Ravindranathan, uh, from whom you'll be hearing in a, in a few moments. This is an award ceremony and it's also a convocation and I have a, a stake in both because I'm not just the, the chair of the uh, awards jury. I'm also visiting faculty at the Asian College of Journalism. And normally I would have spent two months in Chennai uh, in February and March this year. In fact, it's the first February and March I've spent in London for five years. And wow, I'd forgotten just how chilly it gets in London at that time of year. I really do miss Bessie's Beach uh, and uh, the, 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 the real experience of Chennai. and I miss the students, I have to say. Um, I'm proud to say that some of the students I taught are among those graduating or post-graduating today. We've never met, of course, and all my teaching this year has been on Zoom. And that's not ideal, but actually it was altogether a, a better experience than I had imagined. And that's primarily because of the students. Uh, and I would like to thank those who attended my classes, first of all, for turning up, but more than that, uh, for your talent and for your hard work, but even more for your enthusiasm, your resilience, and your determination to rise above the pandemic and the restrictions it occasioned. Because I think it was your resilience, your energy, which made the classes, from my point of view, worthwhile, and I hope from your point of view as well, and for all of us, I believe, fun. And to all the students at this convocation, very warm congratulations. You should feel good about yourself and your achievements. And I wish you well in your future careers, whatever you choose to do. I'll be watching out for your names and your bylines. Stay curious, be ambitious, and be kind. And I say that because to be a good and successful journalist requires compassion and humility as much as scoops and exclusives. As uh, uh, Mr. Ram has been saying, journalism is not always an easy profession, especially at the moment. But the public health crisis that we're all still living through has once again demonstrated that people need information they can trust. They're hungry for journalism in which they can have confidence, which is authoritative and impartial and inquiring. They want and deserve to know what's happening, what's not happening and why. And that is the social purpose that we all serve and I believe it's a very important one. The shortlisted entries for the two awards that we're about to announce demonstrate just how vital and effective is the very best journalism. It's been a hugely impressive body of work across themes, platforms, languages, styles of reporting and investigation. So my main purpose is to tell you who's won. And as well as the winners, we have special mentions. So we're first of all going to look at the ACJ Investigative Journalism Award. And we have three special mentions, uh, entries which came very close indeed uh, to winning. So first of all, a special mention for Environment Undone by Disha Shetty, Tish Sangera and Pankori Kumar, which appeared on India Spend, an impressive series of articles about how some of India's infrastructure projects are damaging the environment and how legal safeguards are failing to stem this damage. Uh, also a special mes uh, mention for Inside Syria, The Naked and the Dead by Lakshmi Subramanian uh, for the week. 
a really powerfully written account of a remarkable and hazardous journey to track down Indian detainees in prison camps in Syria and Kurdish Iraq. And a special mention too for the Paris series on women's health uh, submitted by Shalini Singh for the People's Archive of Rural India. Uh, a clearly written and exceptionally reported series of short articles on aspects of women's health from forced hysterectomies to access to sanitary napkins, subjects which are all too often hidden from view in the mainstream media. But I'm now going to announce the winner of the ACJ Investigative Journalism Award, and it is uh, Crime and Prejudice by Prabjik Singh and Arshu John, which appeared in The Caravan a deeply impressive and deeply unsettling account of the Delhi riots of last year. Uh, and you'll be hearing uh, the full citation in just a moment. But Prabjit and Arshu, you have my admiration and congratulations. Um, Thank you, sir. And I'm now gonna move on to the KP Narayana Kumar Memorial Award for Social Impact Journalism. And there are four special mentions uh, for that award. Uh, the first is Shooting Up by Divya Gupta in The Caravan. Uh, this is a vivid account of heroin use in Himachal Pradesh and of de-addiction centers, some of which very shockingly are bogus. Also a special mention for Enor Living in Ashes by uh, Aparna Ganeshan, Vigneshwar K, Vivek Manoharan, and Prajish K for Asheville. It's about the impact of fly ash pollution on local communities and it's effective visually as well as editorially. Uh, a mention as well, a special mention for Buzz of Hope. After numerous tiger encounters, traditional honey gatherers of the Sundarbans get a new lease of life. This is by Tanmoy Paduri uh, for Gown Connection, a very compassionate piece of journalism which is a virtue of not simply reporting on a social problem, but in a small but successful step taken to address it. And we have a fourth special mention, which is for Corona Cyclops by Shrutin Lal and Dibyo Das for Asheville. This is the work of two young video journalists who cycled uh, from Delhi to Lucknow in weather similar to this, meeting up with and sharing the testimonies of migrant workers who were on the road and near destitute because of the impact of the initial COVID lockdown. Now, the winner of the KP Narayana Kumar Memorial Award for Social Impact Journalism is from Segregation to Labour, Manu's Caste Law Governs the Indian Prison System by Sukanya Shanta for The Wire. A truly revealing piece of journalism about the officially sanctioned persistence of caste discrimination within the prison system. Again, you'll be hearing the full citation in just a moment, but my warmest of congratulations to Sukanya Shanta. I'd li now like to invite the chief guest, Professor Pratap Banu Mehta, to bestow the awards upon the winners. Um, good evening. It's a real honor and privilege uh, to bestow these awards um, uh, on the winners. And I have to say that I think uh, I've read these stories. I, I, I was heartened by the fact that I must be reading some of the right things, certainly Prabhjot's uh, uh, story, that these are the kinds of stories that honor the award they receive as much as the award honors these stories. Uh, so consider the, uh, the award bestowed with our warmest congratulations, but more importantly, uh, the deepest gratitude uh, of a democracy that needs more stories like these. Uh, congratulations to all the winners and all those uh, who got the special mentions. Thank you very much indeed, Professor Mehta. Uh, I'm now going to ask a, a fellow member of the jury, uh, Anu Raghunathan, to speak and to deliver the ACJ Investigative Journalism Award citation. Anu. Thank you, Andrew. Good evening, everyone. I would like to begin with a quote by Mahatma Gandhi. A journalist's peculiar function is to read the mind of the country and give definite and fearless expression to that mind. 
when i look at this year's entries for investigative journalism i feel this is exactly what they have done all these articles spoke up against a variety of injustices ranging from the daily riots to women's health to the environmental concerns around huge infrastructure projects to the plight of syrian refugees and prisoners i particularly appreciated the rigor which went into creating these compelling stories reporters followed the documents and the data and the people to arrive at the nuts and bolts of a story they teased out the nuances in subjects by presenting multiple perspectives take the winning entry from the caravan where the reporters have evidently scored through fir's chart sheets and eyewitness accounts or take the case of the india spent series on the environment where the reporters analyzed 2115 environment clearances to piece together a riveting series with good supporting graphics and timelines on environmental projects if you look at the people's archive of rural india series on women's health the group of reporters addressed a range of issues from infertility among the adivasi bills in maharashtra to malnutrition among mothers to be in gudulur in tamil nadu to the forced hysterectomies performed on girls with disabilities in rural maharashtra meanwhile the stories on syria were obtained after an arduous journey across desert highways avoiding potential is sleeper cells to recount the stories of refugees and prisoners all in all they went to great lengths to report and write these stories and their employers printed what everyone else was not printing we arrived at a winning entry and a special mentions based on the fact that they raised uncomfortable questions they challenged the status quo and they dug deep with doggedness and determination and all of these attributes in a new story or series are even more important in today's context while we commend these examples of journalism i would urge all of you to consider one disturbing data point as many of you know india fell two places in the world press freedom index we are ranked 142 among 180 countries that does not bode well for journalists who are exposed to violence and vilification and hate campaigns it is my hope and prayer that you the students of the asian college of journalism will be able to practice your craft in a free vibrant competitive and thoughtful media landscape i would like to congratulate each and every one of you graduating today good luck to all of you with this let me get to the citation the range and quality of the entries for this award are a hugely encouraging demonstration of the vigor of investigative journalism and its ability to shine light on dark corners and to hold those with power to account the winning entry exposes uncomfortable truths about one of the most painful episodes of a particularly turbulent period in india's history the riots which engulfed the nation's capital in early early in 2020 prabhjit singh and arshu john writing in the caravan present a detailed and meticulously researched account of the delhi riots their journalism is powerful compassionate and compelling it is built on the vivid and unsettling testimony of those who witnessed and suffered in those riots their article crime and prejudice goes far beyond simply reciting eyewitness accounts to testing and challenging the conflicting versions of what happened amid the chaos and confusion of the moment timelines are developed contested narratives are challenged and complaints to the police and fir's cited and examined as with the best investigative journalism this article looks at what happened from all perspectives including going to some length to reflect the response of those named as complicit in the violence the writing is clear and unsensational the article draws a dismal picture of vicious communal riots conducted in plain sight and of vigilante groups acting with impunity and chronicles the apparent culpability of some local politicians the profound shortcomings in the police response and a seemingly vindictive pursuit by the authorities of what appear to be false criminal cases at a time of crisis 
when the news media is under pressure to fall into line with the official narrative of events the role of investigative journalists is both more vital and more hazardous than ever as well as expressing admiration for the journalism of prabhjit singh and arshu john we wish to commend all those news organizations such as the caravan which are willing to resource and to publish long and complex investigative endeavors and so ensure that we are all better informed for without an independent respected and fearless news media democracy is diminished and so are we all thank you and congratulations again to the graduates Thank you very much Anu and can I invite you all to join in a virtual round of applause for Prabhjit Singh and Arshu John. Thank you. Um and I'm now going to ask uh, the third member of the jury uh Pari Ravindranathan to say a few words and to deliver the KP Narayana Kumar Memorial Award for Social Impact Journalism citation. just unmuted myself thank you very much uh, andrew uh, this award the kp narayana kumar memorial award for social impact journalism is very close to my heart it's in the memory of my acj classmate as nalini mentioned he was from the first batch of of uh, of my uh, of uh, of acj so was i he was one of my closest friends and a brilliant journalist um, it's been 2 years since he died but i think i speak for all his friends some of whom are on the call uh when i say that we miss him dearly just as much today uh so it's it's great honor for me to be on the jury with andrew and anna uh we had a problem of plenty uh with this award as uh, i'm sure andrew and anna will agree with me while one of them won the others were all incredible stories brilliant reporting painstakingly done over long periods of time the breadth of topics so wide and as you saw two video pieces in the special mention which were visual which were visually stunning and uh, and very detailed and so so we so it was it was a difficult choice uh, for us and the breadth of topics were uh, were incredible uh, i'll move quickly to the citation um without expanding so much because i agree with everything that anu said and i don't know how much more i can add to that <laughs> um this is the this is the this uh, moving on to the citation This is only the second year of the KP Narayana Kumar Memorial Award for Social Impact Journalism yet it has attracted an impressive field of entries across platforms reflecting different approaches to the reporting of social problems and inequalities the winning entry succeeds emphatically in giving voice to the voiceless and in shining a light on underreported issues Sukanya Shanta writing for the wire focuses on one of the most hidden of social issues what happens behind bars in india's prisons the entry convincingly reveals the persistence of caste based segregation discrimination and division of labor within the prison system in states which have chosen not to adopt the model prison manual the official connivance in this persistence of caste based inequality is shocking the seeming reluctance of prisoner welfare organizations to address the issue is almost equally disturbing Sukanya Shanta's article from segregation to labor manus caste law governs the indian prison system powerfully meets the two essential requirements of successful social impact journalism it exposes an injustice which has been largely concealed from public view and it lays the groundwork through well researched and clear expressed reporting to stimulate and inform a campaign for redress thank you so much and i and i wish all the students the best of luck and all the all the bodies the best of luck mr thank you to the jury members thank you uh, mr andrew whitehead sanu raghunathan and mr pari damdranathan we are deeply appreciative uh, of all your efforts and for your uh, wonderful contributions uh i now like to invite uh, the awardees uh, and we sh- we to to make uh, the acceptance remarks uh, so first up we'd like to invite uh, arshu john and prabjit singh the winners of the acj award for investigative journalism thank you thank you everyone for your word it's i mean it's very it's a great feeling to win this award and we're very grateful uh but i it's also slightly bittersweet to get it to be honest i mean bittersweet in the sense that 
it's now been a year over a year since the delhi violence and i mean prabhjit went to prabhjit and i went to great lengths to sort of document it at this with this level of detail with the number of people he spoke to and despite all that we've had no fir's no investigation no case no nothing into the several people we have named in the story um i mean it's absurd i mean it should be absurd rather but i mean this is something that prajeet and i discussed during while we were reporting it as well that don't expect any response from the police they are going to ignore this and post the story as well we expected them to ignore it and that's what they did and i mean so following the story it sort of took me a little time to sort of come to terms with the fact that the goal post seemed to have shifted of journalism and now record keeping is sort of the b and n b all and end all of what we're doing here uh given that for the record i just want to repeat some facts from the story satyapal singh bjp mp from bagpath was accused of instructing the police during the violence and of receiving money looted from a mosque in madrasa mohan singh bisht bjp's mla from karawal nagar was accused of personally inciting a mob to attack muslims and of himself throwing an explosive at a muslim household kapil mishra is accused of inciting a mob to to violence with casteist and communal abuse Uh, he is also accused of instructing the police to attack muslims nand kishor gujjar bjp's mla from loni is accused of asking the hindu mob to record videos of a muslim being burnt alive and to send it to them and jagdish pradhan bjp from bjp's former mla from mustafabad is accused of coordinating with the mob as they prepared to burn one muslim to death these are all things we've reported with eyewitnesses on record and despite this none of it has happened i mean there's no been no case so thank you but this is just the times we live in i thought that's worth repeating prajit to you yes uh, thank you all of you uh, uh thanks to uh, the honorable jury members and all the this esteemed institution you know for this award it's really inspiring Uh, Ashwin, there is no FIA, no action. Uh, it doesn't mean. I mean to say, this is no uh, point to you know just sit back and to have any kind of disillusionment. We'll be carrying on it further, you know. Uh, and I'm staying on these stories in quotes, and uh, I'm going to continue. You know, uh, I'm sitting on these. So I'm staying on these stories to follow it up in cases, and you know, I'm going to haunt them even if it goes to the highest courts, to the Supreme Court. And this is my next responsibility now to take such cases to logical end. this is i just wanted to share uh, with you and it, if the system is insensitive we should be equally aggressive rather more aggressive to play our role as a media this is all i have to say uh, thanks all of you thank you arshu and uh, thank you prabhjit for your uh, passionate remarks um, and uh, we wish you all the best uh, in pursuing the story um, further uh, now i'd like to call upon sukanya shanta to please uh, share her remarks for the uh, for the winner for being the winner of the social impact uh, journalism award um good evening um thank you so much for this award um uh, it means a lot uh, to me to be uh, recognized uh, particularly for this story um india has a serious problem of mass incarceration uh, annually uh, around 4 uh, and a half lakhs to 5 lakh people end up in indian prisons uh the popular perception brands all those accused of a crime as bad people who deserve the miseries that they have to uh, bear the general uh, public apathy has only made it difficult to uh, draw attention to the realities of the uh, neglected and the reviled uh, group of people uh but to my mind uh, an even bigger problem is that this incarceration is carried out purely on the basis of individual caste and religious identity um uh, in a country where over 70% of the uh, jail population belongs to uh, the bahujan caste identities across uh, religions uh, it is difficult to separate the carceral system from manu's uh, caste laws um, in this story i have uh, tried to dig deeper uh, and understand how prisons are structured and how caste like in the rest of the society decides one's position in the uh, in, in prison uh this was a month long investigation and uh, analysis uh, uh, of an extremely uh, regressive and casteist prison laws were done uh, through this period uh, just to show that like manu's caste laws uh, prison structure 2 is built on the foundation of the uh, of the caste system 
uh, for example, say uh, a Brahmin who actually ends up in 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 uh, in, in a prison uh, gets to lead a comfortable life, uh, maybe handling just uh, a simple kitchen work or simple uh, uh, jail uh, paperwork, while those belonging to the SC, ST, OBC, NT, BNP communities are pushed to do uh, pushed to uh, uh, into doing uh, manual scavenging or uh, or similar such uh, uh, menial jobs in jails. Uh, none of this is voluntary. All of this is like very well structured uh, uh, casteism that actually is continued in the prisons. Uh, these real realities are really difficult to actually talk about, uh, more so because of the existing hostile public opinion against uh, those in prison. Uh, our hostility has given the establishment a free hand in uh, depriving prisoners of their constitutional rights and system a chance to escape any kind of accountability. Uh, it has perpetuated indifferences uh, towards the accused and uh, allowed institutional cruelty to become a norm. Um, I, I am really hoping that uh, media actually covers prisoners' stories more extensively and uh, uh, the whole prisoners' rights discourse finally focuses on the prevalent caste reality, something that is completely missing at this moment. Uh, I also hope that uh, media narrative, uh, narratives around prisoners uh, uh, which perpetuates this whole notion of good and bad actually eventually changes. Um, now, like, I, I would actually uh, like to thank uh, uh, all those many uh, anti-caste uh, scholars and le leaders who I have been reading uh, for, for, uh, for really a long time and have tried to Im imbibe them in my writings. And um, also uh, would like to thank uh, uh, the incarcerated persons uh, who have actually trusted me with their stories and because of which I have been able to write on prisons uh, for, for some time now. Uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, the Wire and Pulitzer Center for making this uh, uh, this story possible. Um, and thank you once again to ACJ for this award. Um, and congratulations, Parajit Singh and uh, and uh, Arshu, uh, for winning this uh, the investigative uh, journalism award. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sukanya. Uh, and thank you again, uh, Prabhjit and Arshu. Many, many congratulations to the both of you on your uh, wonderful achievements. And thank you for setting the bar so high uh, with, with the professional excellence that you're displaying with all your work. Uh, many congratulations to all uh, members of, uh, you know, who, who made the entries and uh, with those who received the special mentions as well. And we'll, uh, we're also very grateful again to our uh, jury members, both the final jury and the preliminary jury for taking the time to make these awards possible. Uh, thank you uh, once again. Uh, with this, we come to the end of the first part of uh, uh, this event, which is the award ceremony. And now we switch over to uh, the convocation of the class of 2021. I now hand over to uh, Mr. Shashi Kumar to take the event further. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nikhil. Uh, before I continue, I just want to uh, inform everyone that on top right of your screen, there is a the two modes of seeing, you know, there's a gallery view and speaker view. Uh, now that I'm going to introduce Professor Pratap Manu Mehta, and he's going to del deliver the Lawrence Dana Pinker Memorial uh, Lecture. Um, if, if you want to see him full screen, as I imagine you would, uh, do click on the speaker view. Uh, the gallery view you would give you, you know, everyone in the same in the boxes. Uh, otherwise, you will have a fuller, fuller view of the person who's speaking. Uh, let me add my voice of um, admiration and congratulations to the uh, winners of the two ACJ awards and also the special mentions. Uh, and I'm sure for our students, this is, uh, uh, this is very inspiring. This is what makes, I think, works like these make journalism worthwhile. Uh, even if, uh, as we note, the impact is a long and uh, a painful wait particularly in these times, or the, the result of these, these, these investigative and importantly impactful uh, journalistic work. It's my, now my pleasant, uh, distinctive uh, and pleasant privilege to introduce to you the uh, chief guest and speaker of the evening, uh, Professor Pratap Bhanu Mehta. Not that he needs an introduction, but for reasons of form more than anything else. He's a political scientist, he has taught at Harvard, NYU, Global Law School, JNU, and Ashoka University. He has served as president of the Center for Policy Research and as vice chancellor of the Ashoka University. He has published widely on political theory, constitutional law, Indian politics, and international affairs. 
His most recent work is the Oxford Handbook of the Indian Constitution, co-edited with Martha Kosla and Sujit Chaudhary. He is an editorial consultant to the Indian Express and a prolific columnist. And I'm sure our journalists, young journalists, will take note of that. Here's someone who transcends the barriers of academia, you know, steps out into uh, writing, and he writes, I mean, his, his writing is nothing short of scintillating, as some of you have read him, Will Will Vouch. He is also a recipient of the Infosys Prize of 2011, and Professor Mehta studied PPE at Oxford and has a PhD in politics from Princeton University. Professor Lata Banu Mehta to deliver the Lawrence Dana Pinkham Memorial Lecture. Professor. Um, very good evening to all of you. Uh, I must confess this is a truly humbling and uh, occasion for me and I'm quite intimidated uh, for three reasons. One, uh, because ACJ School of Journalism is one of the finest academic institutions in the world. Uh, and it really has uh, preserved uh, an extraordinary legacy uh, of excellence in very difficult circumstances. And I'd like to begin by congratulating uh, the, ch the, the chair, the trustees, the faculty, and the students of ACJ School of Journalism uh, for the extraordinary work you have done. You deserve a round of self-applause. I know you're all usually humble, but you deserve a round of self-applause. Uh, 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 uh. Second, of course, um, the graduating class of uh, 2021 from uh, ACJ School of Journalism. Uh, this is the class uh, and this is the kind of group that continues to inspire and renew our hope uh, and optimism about Indian democracy. Yes, we are going through a little bit of a dark phase to put it mildly, but when I think of a group of students like this um, uh, that we have in ACJ class of uh, uh, 2021, you cannot but help think that these are not students that are going to be held back for long. Uh, they are going to be the kinds of agents of change and integrity that N. Ram talked about. Um, and I think in the face of this talent, any speaker feels, I think, a little bit intimidated. The third reason I have to confess is uh, more the occasion. Uh, I'm truly grateful and honored uh, and grateful to uh, 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 Dr. Shashi Menon, uh, the trustees of the ACJ school to, who asked me to deliver the Lawrence Dana Pinkham lecture. And it was a difficult choice for me to think about what to speak on an occasion like this. It is a memorial lecture in the honor of a legend in journalism, uh, Lawrence Dana Pinkham. Uh, yet it is also at the same time being held at as part of a convocation. So it can't be a conventional academic paper with, 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 with the standard boring protocols of academic uh, sort of discussion. Uh, nor am I, I think, uh, the kind of journalist uh, who we have seen honored today, who actually is producing uh, new factual knowledge, new truths uh, uh, very powerfully and under very difficult circumstances. So what I thought I'd do perhaps most usefully uh, is step back a little bit from the controversies of our times. I will refer to them as I go along and ask a rather difficult question, uh, which has been puzzling me, uh, which is who actually wants the truth? Uh, at one level, right, the value of truth, if you want to put it this way, should be obvious to all of us. Uh, this group in particular right, has in a sense chosen a vocation whose reason right, at one level is truth. This is going to be your professional personal identity right, for your lives. Uh, we all want to seem we all seem to want the truth for a number of reasons. Right? Often there are very pragmatic reasons. If there is a tree in front of me while I'm driving a car and I'm oblivious to the truth of that tree in the middle of the road, I'm likely to crash my car into that tree, right? I mean, there's a very kind of pragmatic reason that just for surviving, just for living, we need the truth, right? 
Uh, there are pragmatic reasons relating to interpersonal trust. If I repeatedly lie and am caught out, one assumes, although that doesn't happen often these days, uh, I will be the object of distrust. It raises the costs of my functioning in society. Uh, often truth is useful because as Mark Twain very nicely put it, uh, one of the advantages of speaking the truth is that you don't need a long memory. Right? It's only if you lie in a sense that you're actually burdened uh, by your past. So there are all kinds of very quotidian reasons, right? Why we all want the truth with capital T, with small t. But there is, seems to be something about this moment in our politics and in our wider culture that truth seems to be something that is in contention in a very specific and different kind of way than it has been historically. Uh, when I was listening to the ACJ award citations, the first thought that was crossing my mind was, look, this is such an extraordinary testament to the journalistic profession of the kind of truth that it can produce. It is holding our feet to the fire. It is revealing facts to us, right? It is representing reality. And yet the acceptance speeches of these distinguished journalists actually highlighted the problem. The truth has been produced, but who is receptive to this truth? Certainly we don't expect authoritarian governments to be receptive to these truths. Uh, and India is passing through, Indian democracy is passing through an absolutely unprecedented phase where the triple ills of communalism, authoritarianism, and social equality, uh, social inequality rather, are combining in an unprecedented cocktail, right? So what is it about our cultural moment that while truth is being produced, you will have 200 wonderful journalists being produced by the ACJ College this year, right? Agents of truth. We are all worried about the receptivity of truth. Who wants the truth? Right? And so what I'll offer is some moral psychological reflections on this question. This is not going to be a philosophical discussion on the concept of truth. I take it for granted that in all these quotidian ways we understand what we mean by truth for our purposes. But it's going to ask a slightly awkward question. Right? What are the cultural conditions under which we might become more receptive to truth? So that's the task I've set myself. And, and as, as you can see, it's probably a fool's uh, uh, enterprise. So we all know truth has been a complicated idea philosophically, culturally, and psycholog psychologically. Truth. It is often said disconcerts, it can make us uncomfortable, which is why we run away from it. But sometimes we also say the truth will set us free. It enables emancipation. Philosophers often worry about what truth is. Is it correspondence to reality? Is it relative to some conceptual scheme in which it is embedded? In the Indian tradition, Mahatma Gandhi very famously declared truth is God ought to be the object of our highest allegiance. And these days, whenever I use that line in classroom, some student points out that maybe Gandhi did truth a disfavor by calling truth God, because God is often elusive and very difficult to attain. Uh, so perhaps there was a kind of implicit joke in that claim as much as anything else, right? Uh, and if truth is like God, it will be rarely be seen often betrayed and mostly misunderstood. There was a time you might remember when India's national identity was defined in terms of truth, right? In popular culture. Remember that song, Jaha hoto pe sachai rehti hai, right? India is the land where truth is on everyone's lips. That, seem, that song seems so incongruous now. I mean, you couldn't even sing it with a straight face, right? But of course, we also know politically, right? The truth has always been in question, always been a matter of contention. The dividing line between truth and opinion is as old as democracy and civilization itself. Plato's Republic, the classic text 
that claims to resist the allure of the idea that's only opinion, right? That's what the sophists were arguing, right? That aletheia, truth has to be in some senses, the measure of our souls, not opinion, right? Pointed this worry out a long time ago. Marxists, right, in a very prescient way, have always pointed out that until all forms of oppression are abolished, no genuine truth telling is possible. Our dominant modes of knowledge, whether it be socialized, social science, literature, uh, journalism, our dominant modes of knowledge and criteria of truth actually obscure and throw a veil over relations of oppression. Uh, think of Marx's analysis for the truths of economics, for example, right? It was supposed to cast a veil over reality, convert, for example, relations between people into relations between things. Yeah. Uh, Hannah Arendt, most importantly, I think for us, in the context of totalitarian regimes, raised the specter whether the possibility that gigantic lies and monstrous falsehoods can eventually become established as unquestioned facts, to quote her, that humans may be free to change their own past at will and the difference between truth and falsehood may cease to be objective and become a matter of mere power and cleverness, of pressure and of infinite repetition. Apart from causing suffering, the authoritarianism of our times seems to be directed squarely at the idea of truth. Let's carpet bomb the idea of truth itself, right? So what is it that explains the success of this carpet bombing of truth, the creation of cultural conditions? Right? where although a lot of truth is produced, as I said, as all of you have demonstrated, right? the receptivity of truth to truth in some senses diminishes. Right? And that's really the puzzle in a sense, I want to in a sense reflect upon, right? This is a rumination on the moral psychology of truth. And what I want to suggest rather controversially is that a lot of the resistance to receiving truth does not come only from the conventional enemies of truth. Authoritarian regimes have always been, they're in some senses the most transparent enemies of truth, right? You can at least spot them. They tell you what they are doing. We are censoring you. We are preventing you from speaking. We will throw journalists in space, you know, jail if they speak, right? There's, there's a kind of odd transparency, at least about it. They're, you know, they're not interested in the distinction between propaganda and truth. They're quite happy to say, yes, all truth is the production of propaganda and we will do it no holes barred. Okay. So it's a big enemy. It has to be politically resisted. But conceptually, right, authoritarian regimes don't pose a deep problem about truth, right? Okay. The more uncomfortable resistance to the idea of truth comes from possibly sources that you and I all believe in, right? This was certainly a question Plato had raised. Does the resistance to truth, might it not come from democratic regimes themselves, something inside a democracy, not just the censoriousness of a tyrant. And is our cultural moment one where both of those forces, right, the censoriousness, authoritarianism, coercion of the tyrant is actually coinciding and mobilizing the resistance to truth within a democracy right? and creating a new kind of explosive force that makes us resistance to truth. So what are the ways in which the resistance to truth might be coming from faith places that are actually comfortable to us, right? From values that otherwise seem salutary. And I just want to briefly list out sort of 
four or five of those to begin with to kind of as a provocation. The first is, uh, and this is from the philosopher Bernard Williams, uh, uh, who's influenced a lot of my thinking on philosophical thinking on the question of truth. Does an ardent desire for truth undermine truth itself? Bernard Williams once wrote, and I think this is one of the most profound psychological observations on our time. He said, quote, two currents are very prominent in modern thought and culture, an intense commitment to truth and an eagerness to see behind appearances, a readiness against being fooled. Together with this demand for truthfulness, there is an equally pervasive suspicion about truth itself, whether there can be such, thing, such a thing, right? Whether truth can itself be more than relative or subjective, or indeed, whether anybody who claims to possess the truth actually possesses it. These two are connected. The desire for truthfulness drives a process of criticism, which paradoxically ends up weakening the assurance that there is any secure or unqualifiedly stable truth. Williams was making the point that whether in part our suspicion that anybody possesses the truth comes from our ardent advocacy of truth, right? So this is in a sense the paradox, right? We are so committed to truthfulness and standards of truthfulness that we are really suspicious of the idea that anybody actually possesses those, right? Do you in a sense see the paradox, right? And as a cultural moment, we are so good at unmasking everything, right? In the name of truth, and yet that very drive, that very criticism leaves us in a place where we are less and less sure of who actually possesses the truth. So that's in a sense, the first kind of paradox. The second paradox, the second point, you might say lovers of freedom require the truth. We often say truth sets you free, right? Uh, accountable societies are free societies. But we are in this very interesting cultural moment where people often think of truth as coercive, as something that is the opposite of freedom. You know, normally when we say something is true, we are obliged to believe it, right? If two plus two equals four, I'm obliged to believe that two plus two equals four, right? But what if you think that the coercion of truth, the fact that it's obligatory itself is an assault on your freedom. Hannah Arendt again, very perceptively asked this question once, is truth conservative, right? It presupposes a presumptive reality to which our ideas correspond, but lies, misrepresentations, illusions, or alternative realities, we can experience an exhilarating display of freedom in those domains. Truth is the provenance of reason, reason, right? It's normally tied to the faculty of reason. But we like to inhabit our imaginations. Making things up is so much, gives us so much the sense of freedom, being unconstrained by anything, right? That's it's actually alluring. We find imagination more liberating than reason. And the attractiveness of political leaders who are contemptuous of reason, who are contemptuous of truth, just is this. We identify in their contempt of truth and in their contempt of reason, a kind of vicarious freedom. Nothing constrains me. What could be freer than that? Right? Uh, again, to invoke Karl Marx in a very different context, you know, Marx's most un-Marxist text, uh, the 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte, right? 
one of the things he points out, what's the fascination of this dictator Louis Bonaparte? I mean, not just the fact that he's interested in theater and you know, there's the aesthetic dimension by the way in which he creates power. He says, paradoxically, most of the people would rather believe Louis Bonaparte for this reason. He simply comes and openly says, I do not believe in truth and reason anymore. This makes me more truthful than those who hold on to the illusion of truth and reason. Right? Right? And which is why so many of our arguments don't work. Right? How do you make a parody of somebody who says, I am a parody? How do you crack a joke at somebody who says, I am the comedy? Right? How do you refute with reason somebody who says, but there is something greater than reason and truth? Imagination. Think of where I can take you if you just let your imagination swear. Right? And I think we are in this interesting cultural moment where truth has become associated with inhibition. What is the allure of the tyrant, the authoritarian, this politics of disinhibition, right? We say often their politics is shameless. But remember, remember the allure of shamelessness is a certain kind of freedom, right? And I think we are underestimating the degree to which in identifying with tyrants and authoritarian leaders like this who are openly contemptuous, we actually find in them this kind of vicarious freedom. Well, at least he's got the one big truth. That there is no truth. So the idea that people experience freedom and truth turns out to be only very conditionally true. You might say, does not democracy require truth, right? Isn't truth necessary for transparency and accountability? And of course, this argument is true. I passionately believe it. We work on India's public institutions. As journalists, you've given your life to this vocation. But of course, we also know that the reality of democratic politics is more complicated for two very good democratic reasons. And that's the difficult part, right? The first is democracy as we practice it is characterized by two features, plurality and partisanship. What do I mean by plurality? We start out with a basic assumption that we are diverse, we disagree with each other, right? And this disagreement is a thing to be cherished. It's a permanent feature of an open, liberal, democratic society, right? But here is one of the challenges of disagreement for politics. In fact, politics becomes necessarily precisely because we disagree. If we all agreed on the truth, politics actually might become unnecessary, right? Because the job of politics, the circumstance that occasions politics is the circumstance of, in some senses, disagreement and variety, right? Okay. Now, what that means often is that politicians have to inhabit two zones that are somewhat in tension with truth. They have to inhabit the zone of legitimacy rather than validity. We, of course, disagree on the truth. My job is to get enough people on my side to persuade them that, you know, my side is correct. Right? And their job traditionally has been social mediation. If each of us insists we have the truth, then the work of politics will not work. Right? And so politics in that sense is not anti-truth. It's not always full of falsehood, but you can see right, that in some senses, it is almost always post-truth. It is only when truth can't do its job in producing a consensus that politics steps in. Right? The second point about politics, democratic politics, is of course partisanship. Achieving power requires coalitions. Coalitions are built on taking sides. My party versus your party. My leader versus your leader. My ideology versus your ideology. 
And so long as the structure and organization of power is based on partisanship, right? You can imagine the cultural receptivity of truth will always be a little bit under doubt, right? Because the important thing is for my side to win. That is the essence of this politics, right? Anybody who doesn't take partisanship in democratic politics seriously doesn't understand modern democracies. It doesn't understand politics actually. Now, normally these things work out fine. I mean, we have countervailing institutions, you know, uh, 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 the job of politics is social mediation, but the jobs of science is to give us the scientific truths, the job of the judiciary is to give us the legal truths, the constitutional truths. But of course, what has happened in our times is that that culture of partisanship, once it contaminates every institution, right, it reproduces that same resistance to truth. It is for this reason, by the way, I mean, I, I understand as a social scientist, everything is a politics. Knowledge has its politics. But the pervasive skepticism that knowledge has politics and is politics all the way down, right? In a sense is one of the reasons why the resistance to truth has become so, it becomes easy to dismiss truth. It is partisanship all the way down, right? It's true in the judiciary, it's true in academia, it's true in journalism, uh, it's true in your readership, right? The readers of Wire and Caravan are one group and the reasons of readers of organization are another group, right? So one of the things we have to, in a sense, and that is why I think it's important not to buy into the fiction that we often buy in, that it is indeed politics all the way down. Because that colonization by partisanship of every institution will create the cultural conditions where we are no longer receptive to truth. Let's take another ideal we like. So, okay, so this truth gets us getting us into trouble. Freedom is getting us into trouble. Democracy is getting us into trouble. Let's take equality, uh, the moral psychology of equality. All democracies are marked by a formal commitment to political equality, right? They should have a substantive commitment to political equality. As a principle, this is the cornerstone of our moral, constitutional, and political lives. But as many political theorists, you know, from Plato onwards have pointed out, the moral psychological consequences of political equality are quite peculiar. We often say rightly that we should treat people equally or respect people equally. But we also say that in order to respect them equally, we don't have to respect every argument they give equally, right? That's a normal distinction. I respect you. That doesn't mean I have to respect the argument you give, right? But it is also equally the case, and I'm just saying this moral psychologically, I'm not saying this is right or wrong, I'm just saying the moral psychology, that people feel victimized if their facts or arguments are challenged. It's an easier distinction to make in theory that there is a distinction between respecting a person and respecting their arguments. Or in fact, you could go stronger. Respecting a person often means disrespecting their arguments, right? But psychologically, this is a much, much harder distinction to draw. And I think it's reflected very well in the kind of corruption of language we have. Uh, N. Ram rightly pointed out that the job of media is to be objective. It is not to be neutral, right? And it is amazing how pervasively we often slip between those, those two terms. But when you look at politics and when you look at culture, what is the standard by which they are measuring media? Are you neutral, not are you objective? Now we can dismiss this. We can say this is all self-serving nonsense. You have to understand the distinction between neutrality and objectivity. But think of the moral psychology underlying it. Those who are demanding that media be neutral and neutral then means give both sides equal air. Two plus two equals four and two plus two equals five should have equal media space, right? Right? But those who are demanding neutrality, it is very easy for them to present themselves as victims if you insist on objectivity. 
right? Of course, all of us agree that the proposition that treat everybody equally does not mean treating every argument equally. But think of our own lives, to be honest, right? If your argument has been given a thorough beating, most of us find it difficult to come out of that with our self-respect intact. So what are the cultures of argument that can allow this distinction to take place? Now, these are general features, you might say, of our predicament that from an unexpected source, and I think these are the sources that then authoritarian tendencies are mobilizing within democracies, right? You're not treating us equally, you know, why is victimizing the government? right? Because it's being objective. I mean, think of that statement, right? But think of the moral psychological appeal, right? Would you rather have a leader who can make up any world you can imaginatively inhabit than these leaders who want to, you know, confine you to something as prosaic as reality? Seriously, which is more exciting, right? And in a sense, this is what the authoritarian leaders of our time have grasped how you can use tendencies inherent in democracy against itself to undermine. Now, I quickly want to move on to a second part and this will be much uh, briefer. Um, that, as I said, all of these values, truth, democracy, freedom, equality, are all values we cherish. Right? But the way we inhabit them in ourselves Right? I think makes us vulnerable often to actually resisting truth more than we realize. Now, these pressures on truth are often exacerbated by particular institutional features of our times. There are two features that are obvious, which I won't dwell upon, but I'll just mention and register them. The first is simply that there is no question that we are operating in an environment where our governments, authoritarian governments, want to control the information order, right? We are discovering, as many probably already knew, that in liberal capitalist societies, you can actually use the market, property rights, and the free ownership of media to actually control the information order. You do not need necessarily complete control and ownership by the state to control the information on order. The idea that a private media will be sufficient to produce a free media in pursuit of truth has turned out to be one of the biggest illusions of our times. And there is no question that one of the things that threatens Indian democracy is that the state and capital are now in an unprecedented alliance to control the information order. Look, Indian capital, let's be face it, has always had to be comfortable with the state. It is dependent on the state. It's not going to be a source of resistance to the state. Right? But if you look at the structures of media ownership that are emerging, there is no question that the state capital alliance in controlling the information media right? is something that is, I think, going to take institutional forms that we have not hitherto witnessed. So I'll just, I mean, Enram and all know much more about this. I'll just spark this thought there, uh, 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 not much to dwell on. Uh, the second obvious thought, of course, is the outright use of coercion by the state. Even as we talk about these moral psychological resistance to the idea of the truth, let us not forget the fact Right? The journalists are being imprisoned, that lives are at stake if you go out in search of the truth, uh, particularly if you're a frontline reporter in many states. I think most of us are actually pretty protected, privileged. Uh, so I don't want to discount those two traditional sources of control of the information order, the alliance of state and capital, right? and in a sense, the use of coercive power of the state. But there is a new kid on the block right, that is posing a very particular kind of challenge to us being able to produce or make a population receptive to truth. And that, of course, is social media. 
right? Now, much has been written about social media and I'm no expert on social media, but I do want to make a couple of model psychological points about it. There's no question at one level, social media has been an enormously democratizing force. Uh, at one level, it often seems like social media is the equivalent of the print revolution in the 15th and 16th centuries, right? Remember the revolution in printing, uh, unsettled forms of authority, it completely reshaped our relation to our own selves. It certainly reshaped our relationship between people and God, for instance, right? And I sometimes think that I think there is something about the social media revolution, right? The fact that billions of people can simultaneously directly log in, right? And the way it is changing our sense of self and reality that we have not quite fully fathomed, right? Uh, so I certainly think it's a revolutionary and democratizing force. But there is one particular aspect of social media and the way in which it is used that is, I think, important to think of in the context of truth. So you might say, okay, there's some obvious risks of social media. Uh, the fact that you can be socially ostracized, the fact that trolls can make your life miserable, that social media is now allows for organized witch hunts. Uh, the fact that the form of communication that social media represents allows falsehood, doubt, true, you know, to spread much more quickly than truth. All of those things I think are, are at this point too obvious to be stated, even though we don't have good answers how to deal with them. But the one part I want to focus about, which is in the moral psychology of social media. And I want to focus on this part by making one very simple observation. Again, you might say, as Doc Sherlock Holmes said to Dr. Watson, your grasp of the truth, uh, your grasp of the obvious amazes me. Truth, we know, is often a function of the credibility of the speaker, right? What shapes our sense of truth or whether a particular proposition is true is the credibility of somebody who's saying it. If it's a friend we trust, we are more likely to believe it. If it's an institution we trust, we are more likely to believe it. And as is the case in epistemic communities, right? It is the credibility of that community, the credibility of the speaker that drives your belief in truth, not the other way around. If I believe the Indian Institute of Science, I will also believe they're scientists. Yes, they must be speaking the truth, broadly speaking, right? Okay. Now, one of the things that social media does is that it makes it extremely difficult, extremely difficult for any institution or any individual's idea, identity to remain completely credible. And there are four features of it that make this more difficult. First is in social media, like media more generally, but I think particularly so, all speech, all utterances can be rapidly recontextualized and decon decontextualized, right? Let's say you make it just an innocent statement. A journalist puts out just an innocent statement. Ah, I'm going to a restaurant for the evening. Right, and then there's a picture of nice food. I mean, it's a it's a perfectly quotidian expression of you know what you might be doing that evening. I'm sure many of you have experienced this. Think of the 25 different contexts in which that statement can be used or unused. So, response number one: Ah, Hindu left-wing journalist flaunting his evening privilege. There goes your credibility, boss. Right. I mean, I'm giving you the most quotidian example, right? Right. Uh, context number two, right? Uh, you know, ah, Khan Market's restaurant, right? Must be part of the cabal. Okay, it's a simple factual statement. Now, of course, this can apply to much more serious political matters. A cartoon published in one country can be decontextualized and lead to violence and deaths in another, right? Now, when you think of communicative intent, right? 
you often judge communicative intent by context, right? I know something about the speaker. I know why they are saying it. I know the norms of validation through which this thing has passed, right? But social media's contextual, this recontextualization and decontextualization, one of the things it does is that it makes the, con the communication of communicative intent much harder. And I have to honestly say that the number of people, academics, journalists, I think net net whose credibility has fallen by being on social media is actually much, much higher than the number who gained credibility. And credibility is something for the long haul. Remember, credibility is not about saying I've got the story in, I'm disseminating it to the larger number of people. Credibility is one simple question, right, which this graduating class will have to ask. Am I the sort of person that the larger and larger number of people trust me over the course of a career? Okay. Social media has blurred boundaries, right? A receptivity of to truth paradoxically depends upon maintaining certain boundaries. Uh, part of what makes me credible is if you can separate my professional boundaries from my personal one, right? Again, I'll give you a very flippant example to make the point. The, and, and the flippancy is in a sense the point, right? Uh, suppose I have really bad taste in movies, right? And I continually tweet my bad taste in movies. It's a poorly personal expression, there's no, right? Trust me. If you followed those tweets for about six months, you would ta start taking me less seriously in other domains of my professional expertise as well. Right? Now, one of the things that social media has done is that it has made every quotidian utterance of yours a permanent trace of your public identity. Right? Something as innocent as going to a restaurant. And just think of it this way. If everything you did was out there in the public domain with a permanent trace in history, is it harder or is it easier to establish your credibility? Right? Previously, you just had to establish your credibility to your editor of Wired and Caravan. Have I got this evidence in? Right? Does it pass the hard questions you're going to ask of it? You're credible. Now, you know, I mean, I, I was wearing a controversial t-shirt yesterday. Ah, that must mean my story is wrong, right? So one of the things that social media has done is this intense blurring of the public and the private is going to make the institutionalization of the credibility of individual journalists and institutions incredibly hard, right? All it takes is one mistake, one innocent remark, Right? And it's enough for somebody to cast doubt on you. It's part of the armory of misrecognition they can use against you. Right? And why does this work? This works for the obvious reason that there is an asymmetry between truth and doubt. Producing doubt is much easier than establishing truth. Right? If I want a reason not to trust the stories that have won this award, I can produce that doubt in 30 seconds. You know. Uh, one odd sentence, right? Okay. And what social media does is that it systematically amplifies this asymmetry between truth and doubt. And therefore it has become more propitious to undermining credibility than to establishing the truth, right? Last and finally, uh, and, and, and this is sort of the, the kind of the, the big, conceptual point I want to close in is when we speak of truth, when we speak of language, right, we often think of two different functions of truth and language. Right? One function is, of course, truth as representation, right? Is this a true statement? Right? But one of the most important functions of language is expressive. It is to create an identity. 
language is meant to be an expression of our authentic selves expressions through which we seek validation for our forms of lives we often become something by naming ourselves right language and narratives in short are often used to create an identity now here's the difficult question identities are important to us psychologically they are important to us uh, culturally but identities typically and this is invariably true of any collective identity practically right identities are almost always in the last instance an enemy of truth some identities enable us to see truths it's true that taking on the standpoint of a particular identity can allow you to see an injustice that your current identity might not one of the reasons we want diversity right is because variations in identity allow us to come out of our epistemic bubbles we learn to see people from the points of view of others other identities right but every collective identity by its very nature for it to be a collective identity involves three or four psychological processes on our part it has to be benchmarked who is a good dalit who is a good hindu who is a good christian who is a good indian who is a good englishman right identities are almost always benchmarked the benchmarks may change there may be better benchmarks worse benchmarks but you cannot have an identity without being without being benchmarked somewhere right identities almost always involve abstractions right all identities are collective identities are abstract by their very nature right they in a sense have to militate against the texture of individuality right for you to be part of that collective identity and nationalism of course is 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 the biggest culprit in this right we can live our lives vicariously through this large identification with this large collectivity right okay the allure is that virat kohli six is my six i'm thrilled by it right because i identify with him right as mine right he represents india but that vicarious identification also means in a sense a loss of my individuality right but the most important thing about identities is that identities begin to determine the beliefs often what we choose to believe is a function of our identity not the other way around right uh we want stories in some senses that protect our identities right i mean it's a, it's 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 a which version of history do we believe right the version of history that is most convenient to protecting this important thing called my identity and it is for this reason you know gibbon had this old joke about religion right uh, this was about religion but i think it's more true of collective identities nationalism you know you remember what he said uh, when it comes to religion the philosophers all think it's false the people all think it's true and the politicians all think it's useful the moral psychological challenge for us is right i mean what he what he wanted to say was not just express skepticism about religion but he wanted to also point out this moral psychological fact is that if this is how identities function they are going to be impervious to in a sense factual refutation as professional journalists as professional historians we very doggedly go around saying we are going to give you the true history that will explode the nationalist myth these nationalist myths completely ineffective completely ineffective i think and almost completely beside the point we are probably committing a category mistake right when we juxtapose the identity functions of the claims we make the expressions we use and the truth functions and the blunt truth is 
right? That reason and identity are almost always at odds. You can either have identity, collective identity with a capital C, or you can have reason and truth. You can almost never have both, right? At least not consistently. Okay. So what I've been trying to do, just to sum up, is to provoke you. I mean, this was a rumination more than an argument that the motivation to be receptive to for truth is much rarer than we think. The resistance to it does not just come from evil authoritarian rulers, but also from values and impulses we all share. The authoritarian rulers are a menace because they don't just manipulate the truth, they curb our freedoms, they use coercion, they might put us in jail, they might put us to death, right? But what makes us receptive to their allure, as I said, is actually many of the values that we espouse. So what will this ACJ class have to look out for? Just four very banal closing suggestions. The first is that if truth is a function of credibility, then you have to be ultra careful about every single utterance you make, not just utterances you make as a professional journalist. Right? In some senses, the more you reveal about yourself, the more it can be decontextualized to undermine your credibility. And I think it's this blurring of the public and private, the boundaries of the self, that none of us have fully come to terms with. Right? I mean, it's like in the Mahabharata, you know, even the slightest action will leave a permanent trace. We are psychologically not used to it, right? We are communicative creatures. We like to sort of display ourselves. Right. So that's in a sense the first that maintaining that credibility will require a discipline uh, that I think we're not habitually exposed to. Second, of course, examine the ownerships structures that distort the incentives to truth and the production of truth. Right. The third is, of course, exposing oneself to epistemic diversity in a way that does not make us retreat into our own bubbles, right? Which are very comfortable. But finally, and most importantly, how does one think of collective identities in its many different forms, in ways in which it does not become a threat to reason, right? Nationalism is the most obvious example. But what nationalism shares by way of its capacity to distort the truth, right? It's allure of identity, it's belief distorting functions is actually true of every other form of collective identity. Because that abstraction and alienation that it entails, right? Is something it shares with nationalism. As Harupki Murakami once said uh, about nationalism, it is like cheap alcohol. It gets you drunk after a few shots and makes you hysterical. It makes you speak loud, loudly and rudely. But after your drunken rampage, you're left with nothing but an awful hangover the next morning. And as we know, truth is almost always hazy in this hangover. Behind me, I just remembered, is a portrait of Thomas Hobbes. And my favorite line from Hobbes, and this is what I want to quote, 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 is his definition of hell. He once said, hell is truth seen too late. Okay. I don't think there's a better definition of hell and a better definition of the task ahead of us, which I'm sure this ACJ class of 2021 will fulfill in full measure. Thank you so much for your patience. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Mehta, for what uh, you yourself described as rumination on the moral, rumination rather, on the moral psychology of truth. Uh, a very, very thought provoking uh, address, and I'm sure our students, there's a lot there to take away. We now come to the uh, final part, and the most important part, I think, of the, of the evening, which is to recognize the uh, students who are graduating this year, the diplomates, 
of the class of 2021 of the Asian College of Journalism. Uh, we'll do this uh, in the online form uh, through a video where you will see all the students who are graduating. And this is a pre-recorded video, so it's not going to take too long. It'll take about 10 minutes plus. And at the end of it, I will request uh, Professor Mehta, our chief guest, to, uh, uh, to, to symbolize the award by saying a few words to the students, right? The award of the diplomas. So can we play the video now, Srinivasan? Class of 2021 Postgraduate Diploma in Journalism. Akanksha Madhavram, New Media. Atri Mohanta, New Media. Abhijit Kumar, Print. Adarsh B. Pradeep, Print. Aditi Pokare, Broadcast. Ekantik Bhatt, New Media. Ashwarya Raj, Print. Ajay UK, Broadcast. Akshay Krishna, Broadcast. Amit Chaudhary, Broadcast. Andre Nas, Print. Ananya Dash, Broadcast. Naushka Sharma, New Media. Anushka Jain, Print. Anshua H, New Media. Anvesha Majundar, Broadcast. Arpit Parashar, Print. Aryan Khanna, New Media. Ashish Sharma, Broadcast. Ashwati Sedu Madhavan Nair, Broadcast. Ayusha Chani Singh, New Media. Bharat Sharma, Print. Bhavya Chaturvedi, New Media. Bhavya Sham, New Media. Chinmay Sinha, New Media. Nelson Krishan, Broadcast. Devrati Sarkar, New Media. Dhruva Prasad, New Media. Diksha Sinha, Broadcast. Drishti Ajay Sharma, New Media. Ishan S. Kalyanikar, Trip. Garima Sadbani, Trip. Gautam Salvarajan, Trip. Ishan Paul, Broadcast. JMJ Muna Pachaki, Print. Jayashri R, New Media. Jilam Bhattacharya, Broadcast. Juhi Sivnani, Print. Jyotika Yadav, Broadcast. KS Swati, New Media. Khadija Khan Broadcast Kumal Gutta New Media Shitija Ganshyam Gosavi Broadcast Lavanya Rotella Broadcast Madhurima Datta Broadcast Manish T Print Manvika Adlaka, New Media. Matthew Jacob, Broadcast. Mayan Kumar, Print. Shafiqul Islam, New Media. Meda Nidhi S, Print. Meenachi Prabhu, Print. S and Millennium New Media Moyori So New Media Munis Ahmed Khan New Media Nachinar Kinian M New Media 
नारोमांची साहित्यिक ब्रॉडकास्ट नीलाद्री भट्टाचर्जी न्यूमीडिया निधू केल्शन ब्रॉडकास्ट निहारिका दबजाल न्यूमीडिया निहित सचदेवा फ्रेंड निकिता जोजी जॉन न्यूमीडिया निर्लिप्ता पटनायक न्यूमीडिया निष्ठा नारायण न्यूमीडिया नीतिका गांधी फ्रेंड पल्लवी केसवानी फ्रेंड प्रियल वर्मा ब्रॉडकास्ट प्रियंशी मातोर न्यूमीडिया सोईती दास ब्रॉडकास्ट आर कमला मेनन प्रिंट आर साई वेंकटेश प्रिंट लक्षणा आर ब्रॉडकास्ट राधिका उदास ब्रॉडकास्ट राघव गौतम ब्रॉडकास्ट राघवी गर्ग प्रिंट राहुल महेश्वरी ब्रॉडकास्ट रेबेका एंड जेराट न्यू मीडिया रिम जिम सिंह प्रिंट ऋषिका सिंह न्यू मीडिया प्रिया प्रिंट चालिमाई न्यू मीडिया रुचिका जा ब्रॉडकास्ट रूपाली मंडल न्यू मीडिया रूपा चैटर्जी न्यू मीडिया कैथवस साक्षी सुरेश ब्रॉडकास्ट संचायन जॉर्डर न्यू मीडिया संस्कृति फलोर प्रिंट सप्तषि ए ब्रॉडकास्ट सेरा कुरियन ब्रॉडकास्ट शयानी दास प्रिंट शफना हुसैन न्यू मीडिया शरण्या गुप्ता न्यू मीडिया शेरब वाहू प्रिंट शिवीमोल के जी ब्रॉडकास्ट शिवानी जोशी न्यू मीडिया श्रीजा सुकुमारन पिल्लई ब्रॉडकास्ट श्रुति गौतम ब्रॉडकास्ट श्रुति रामचंद्रन न्यू मीडिया श्रुति रति न्यू मीडिया स्नेहित एबिन जक्रया ब्रॉडकास्ट सोगिनी सेनगुप्ता ब्रॉडकास्ट सोनाली ब्रॉडकास्ट सौरिश समंत न्यू मीडिया श्रीलेखा ए फ्रेंड मुखर्जी ब्रॉडकास्ट सुजन नल्लपने न्यू मीडिया सुप्रिया रमेश न्यू मीडिया सुयाशी स्मृति न्यू मीडिया तनीषा कंडेलवाल ब्रॉडकास्ट बद्री साई तनिष्क चंद्रा प्रिंट त्रिषा मजुंदर न्यू मीडिया ज्वाला बुधराजू प्रिंट वर्षा श्रीराम ब्रॉडकास्ट विश्रुति गिरीश न्यू मीडिया एस एन त्यागराजन प्रिंट संचारी समानता प्रिंट 
अश्वता साहा प्रिंट श्वेता शैंडल्या न्यू मीडिया क्लास ऑफ 2021 पोस्ट ग्रेजुएट डिप्लोमा इन बिजनेस एंड फाइनेंशियल जर्नलिज्म अजय एन अमीशा अगरवाल फर्नांडो ब्राइन सबरी मुत्तू वैलेंटाइन जयवीर सिंह शेखावत ज्योतिषा बी जे मालविका कौर मकोल मालविका मलू फैनास यास्मिन मोहम्मद हुसैन नाविया मित्तल नितिन नरेन श्रेया लक्ष्मी नारायण अपर्णा मेरी बेलिना श्रीजा बासु रॉय professor uh, it's a great privilege and honor for me to um award uh, I, i can't say confer that's that that i think uh, statutory right only belo- belongs to the college authorities but to award um uh, the degrees to the graduating class of 2021 uh it's a tremendous uh, achievement uh, and i'll just say this which is um not only am i confident uh i think i'm 100% sure that the stories you write will be written across the sky of indian democracy in stars the futures is 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 yours just go grab it thank you thank you very much and a very big congratulations from all of us to the graduating class of 2021 uh, and now it's uh, my present duty to request uh, the dean of the acj bloomberg business and financial journalism program nk jarshad to propose the vote of thanks good evening all i'm honored to propose the vote of thanks i would like to first thank our chief guest dr pratap banu mehta for taking time out from his extremely busy schedule to deliver the lawrence dana pinkham memorial lecture thank you for your brilliant insights into the nature of truth and the resistance it faces now thank you also for presenting our awards for investigative and social impact journalism i would now like to thank the final jury comprising andrew whited anu ragunathan and parry ravindranathan for evaluating the award entries and choosing the winners this year i would also like to thank our awards convener nikhil kanekal for ensuring that the awards process went smoothly thanks also to all the journalists who sent in their entries for the awards this has been a year where we have had to learn as much as we taught i would like to thank my colleagues core adjunct and guest faculty for ensuring that while our methods may have changed our standards didn't this wouldn't have been possible without the brilliant support provided by the acj tech team the admin team our library staff and all the other non teaching staff who ensured that everything was as seamless as possible thank you so much for that I would also like to thank our trustees especially our chairman Sashi Kumar for responding quickly to the challenges thrown at us by the pandemic and coming up with workable solutions. I want to thank the news organizations and the journalists who are here and covering this convocation and awards function. But above all I would like to thank the students of the class of 2021 and their parents. The easier option would have been to take a pause during a pandemic year and just focus on maintaining status quo. but you chose to learn and grow it has been a privilege teaching this class thank, thank you for being such a great audience stay safe all the best thank you everybody uh, and uh, for t- particularly to the class of 2021 i said go out there and keep the flag flying and make us proud thank you very much good night